So in this video, we're going to cover environmental cultures, negative stains, and capsule stains. So remember for our environmental cultures, what we did was I gave you guys a nutrient auger plate. And the nutrient auger, remember the auger means that it's a solid. And the nutrient part refers to the fact that on that plate, we supply the bacteria with proper nutrients, uh, proteins, sugars, etc., things that the bacteria would need to grow. And so what I had you do was I had you go out and swab some particular area that you wanted to test for bacterial growth. And what we did was we took that swab and we plated it on that nutrient auger plate and then allowed it to grow for 48 hours at 37 degrees Celsius. And remember that 37 is the temperature of human body temperature. And most bacteria, especially the ones that we care about, would grow optimally at human body temperature. And so what you're going to look at for your plates is you're going to look at the growth on the nutrient auger. And what you'll notice is that when you look at your plates, you're going to have what are colonies. And colonies are a visible number, millions, of identical cells resulting from a single cell. Meaning that each of those little dots represents one bacteria that was originally on that plate. And that one bacteria divided asexually, meaning that it divided from one cell into two. Those two cells to four, four cells to eight, eight to 16, and so on and so forth. Now, bacteria, some bacteria, can divide every 20 minutes, meaning, again, that if you go in a 20 minute interval, you're gonna go from one cell to two, and two cells to four, etc. And in order to get a million bacteria, bacteria only need to grow for about six to seven hours. And so you can see that when you look at those colonies on your plate, that those bacteria have replicated and grown to over a million bacterial colonies, or I'm sorry, a million bacteria um, on the plate, and that becomes a visible mass. And so what you wanna do is you wanna look at the types of colonies that are found on your plate. And you wanna record and try and describe what do those colonies look like. For example, one of the things that you might notice is when you look from the side of your colonies, your colonies have various elevations. Um, if you look on the left, here is the convex. Notice it looks like a little lens. If we look directly to the right of that, there's one called umbani. And umbani are what we, like what I would describe as fried eggs. They have um, a raised middle and edges that are lower than the middle. Again, think of it like a fried egg. Bacteria, for example, in the genus Bacillus. Bacillus anthracis, which is the bacteria that causes anthrax, grows as an umbani type culture. And so you wanna see, do you see these umbani cultures um, on your plate? Some have a plateau, some of them are flat, some have a flat raised middle with spreading edges, some have the edges are raised, um, some are growing into the media itself. And so you just wanna become familiar with looking at the types of colonies on the plate and then describe the elevation. You also wanna look at the margins. So what do the edge of the colonies look like? Um, some colonies are going to be smooth and entire, meaning that the edge of those colonies are completely smooth. Some are what we call rhizoid. Uh, they look like little filaments or little fungi growing out from the culture. Um, some are irregular shaped. Some are lobate. They have these lobes in them. Uh, some are filamentous. And so different types of bacteria have different margins for their colonies as well. And then if you look at the whole colony, you also would want to look at what do what does the whole colony look like? Again, is it round? Is it irregular, filamentous, rhizoid, etc.? And so when you get into class, you'll look at your cultures and see if you can describe what do those cultures look like. Now, another important thing to look at when you're looking at your cultures is to look at the colors that the colonies appear. And those colors are due to the fact that some bacteria produce pigments. And these various pigments make the bacteria grow a particular color. And in a lot of cases, these pigments are what we call virulence factors, meaning that they have the ability to cause disease. Staph aureus, for example, which is a type of bacteria found in skin, 
produces a yellow pigment. And typically, the more pigment that's produced, the more virulent or disease-causing the bacteria is. And so notice that when you look at a mixed soil sample, look at all the diversity in the types of colonies. You see different colors, different sizes, different elevation, and these cultures are very diverse because multiple types of bacteria are found. And so you want to look at the types of colonies that are found on the plate too. If for some of the places that you swabbed, if you see a lot of tiny white or kind of clear colonies, those typically might be bacteria found on skin. So for example, if you looked at, let's say, the surface of your cell phone, you might see little tiny white colonies on your plate, and that doesn't mean that your phone is completely contaminated. It could just be simply bacteria that are normally found on your skin. For example, everybody in class carries a type of bacteria called Staphylococcus epidermidis. But Staphylococcus epidermidis is non-virulent, meaning it doesn't cause disease. And so if you see primarily small, little, white, clear colonies, uh, don't panic. Those are likely just bacteria found on your skin. If we look over here on the bottom left, you can see that different types of bacteria produce different pigments. Um, again, Staph aureus would have a yellow pigment. If we look at uh, bacteria that can produce a reddish pink pigment, we have Serratia marcescens. And Serratia marcescens is an opportunistic pathogen. And what that means is that if your immune system is fine, typically Serratia won't cause any problems. It's only when a person becomes immunocompromised that Serratia can be an issue. Um, if you've ever seen in your bathroom like a pink slime growing in your tub or in your shower, that's likely serratia marcescens growing in there. And what you'll notice is if you've ever had this bacteria in your bathroom, it's extremely difficult to get rid of. And one of the reasons, and you're going to see this in the video in a little bit later, one of the reasons is that uh, serratia marcescens can produce a capsule, produces a slime. And this makes it very sticky, it allows it to adhere to surfaces, which makes it a lot more difficult to get rid of. And so if you see pink slime in places, especially with water, you're likely looking at serratia marcescens. If you look at this one over here that has kind of this light blue turquoise color, um, an example of that would be like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a type of bacteria that is a common cause of death in burn victims. And one of the hallmarks of Pseudomonas is that it produces a blue pigment. And that blue pigment can make the pus appear blue. And so if you look in the wound of a patient who has this type of infection, sometimes the wound has this kind of bluish green hue to it because of the bacteria producing that pigment. In the middle, what you're seeing are these Umbani cultures. And these Umbani colonies, again, have a fried egg appearance. The middle is raised relative to the edge. And so again, this is an example in the middle of Bacillus anthracis. On the far right, if we look at Klebsiella pneumoniae, notice that the colonies have a raised appearance and they're very mucoid, meaning they look kind of mucousy and slimy. And again, it's due to the fact that Klebsiella pneumoniae produces a capsule, and that capsule is what gives it that mucousy um, appearance. So a couple questions for you to get you thinking about your plates. Uh, first things first is, why do we incubate plates upside down? Meaning, why do we incubate our plates auger side up? And the answer is that water is a byproduct of respiration and will move down and can cause the bacteria to smear, whoops, excuse me, 
smear around and cause a large growth. So let me explain what it is that I mean by this. So when we talk about respiration, in lab last time, we started to look at and talk about how bacteria obtain the food that they need. And one of the reasons that bacteria, as well as yourself, need food is that food acts as a starting product for what we call cellular respiration. And this is the process through which cells take food, and in some cases oxygen, and they break down that food and release the energy stored in the food to make ATP. And ATP is the cell's energy. And one of the byproducts of respiration is water. So you can imagine that if you have the water um, and the plate auger side down and bacteria is growing on top of the auger and it produces that water, the water is going to sit on the auger and it's going to cause that bacteria to smear all around meaning that no longer will you get those nice isolated colonies which would allow you to then study that bacteria. Instead, you would just end up with this big smear of bacteria all over your plate. And so when we incubate them auger side up, what happens is, is that the water, the byproduct of respiration, will be produced, but instead of growing, or instead of it falling on the auger, it ends up in the lid. And so that helps to keep that water off the auger and allows us to get nice isolated colonies. So we talked about this one. Why do we label the auger side of the plate? Why not label the lid? And the answer is that this is because in case the lid falls off. Meaning, let's say you were carrying five plates over to the incubator and you happen to drop them. And let's say when you dropped them, the lid and the plate separated from one another. If you happen to label the lid and not the plate and the lid separates, now you have no idea what was growing on that plate. However, if you, uh, if you labeled the auger side of the plate and the lid were to separate, you would still know what was growing on that plate because it's on the auger side. And so we always want to label the auger side of the plate. And again, we don't label all across your plate. You want to be able to see the types of colonies. And so we label along the edge of the plates. Now the next one we haven't talked about yet, but how do we know it is bacteria and not fungi that's growing on our plates? And the answer is, is that fungi take longer to grow and often grow better at room temperature. So for example, when we did this experiment, we took our plates and we grew them in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius for 48 hours, meaning two days. And so because we grew it at 37, it's more likely to encourage bacterial growth than it is to encourage fungal growth. Fungi, which are commonly found in soil, for example, uh, fungi typically would grow best around room temperature, so maybe around 25 degrees Celsius. And so by, by growing those plates at 37, we're encouraging bacterial growth. Also, because fungi take typically longer to grow, you would need to incubate the plates for more than 48 hours to see fungal growth. And so on our plate, we're going to expect that most of, that bact most of the organisms on that plate would be bacteria. If we wanted to see fungi grow, what we would then do is we'll take our plates, we'll put them out at room temperature, and let them incubate for about a week. And at that point, then you might be able to start see some fungi growing on your plates. If it's a mold, which is a type of fungus, molds typically will look kind of fuzzy, uh, 
and that's going to be different than the appearance of bacterial cultures. And so we can encourage fungi to grow by incubating them at room temperature for a week. But initially on your plate, you're probably looking at mostly bacterial growth. So the next activity that we are going to cover is going to be the negative stain. And the negative stain, the purpose of it is to visualize bacterial cells and determine morphology, arrangement, and accurate cell size. So when we talk about morphology, morphology refers to shape. So what is the shape of the bacteria itself? Arrangement has to do with how the colonies are arranged, meaning when the bacteria grows, is it going to be an isolated cell? Is it going to grow as pairs? Is it going to grow in a chain? Is it going to grow as a cluster? And we'll talk about different types of arrangements in a minute. Now, you guys did your gram stain, and one of the things that we did in our gram stain was that we did remember a heat fix step, meaning that you guys put your bacteria on your slide, you allowed that slide to air dry, and then once it was dry, you did a heat fix by passing the slide through the flame three times. And remember that the heat fix step in the gram stain or in any other simple stain, the purpose of that is that the heat fix is going to um, cause proteins to denature, meaning it causes them to unfold, and it also causes those proteins to coagulate, meaning stick together. As a result of this, the bacteria will then adhere to the slide and it will cause the bacteria to be killed. Why don't we use a heat fix step in a negative stain? And that's because the heat can cause fragile cells to shrink. Um, or, and so, for example, if we wanted to determine accurate cell size, if we heat them, those cells are going to shrink and it won't let us um, have an accurate measure of cell size. Additionally, fragile cell types like spirochetes or spirals um, are very sensitive and fragile. And if you cause the if you do a heat fix step, it can cause those fragile cells to become damaged and it would no longer allow you to visually see the appropriate type of morphology. And so the reason that we do a negative stain is that we don't use heat and that's used to determine accurate cell size as well as proper morphology and arrangement. And so I have a question for you and that is why in this example is the background stained in a negative stain? So if you look at this, this picture here of a negative stain, notice that the background is stained and you see these middle clear parts. Well, these clear parts are the cells themselves. So remember that if you're looking at a simple stain, right? A simple stain like a gram stain is also referred to as a basic stain. And in a basic stain, remember what charge would you find on a basic stain? And the answer would be that you would find a positive charge on the stain. Remember when we talked about cells themselves and we said that cells have what type of charge? And the answer is remember that cells have a negative charge. And so in a simple stain, the simple stain has a positive charge and the positive charges are attracted to the negatively charged cell. And so when we do a simple stain, we're going to be staining the cell and not the background. So now thinking about that, what do you think the negative stain has that causes it to stain the background and not the cell? And so first things first, let's start with if the stain is acidic or basic. So if we just said that a basic stain carries a positive charge, what type of stain do you think a negative stain would be? And the answer would be that it is an acidic stain. Meaning that it donates 
hydrogen ions into the solution and as a result the stain is negatively charged right because if it donates H plus to the solution that's gonna mean that the stain is gonna carry a negative charge now now if our stain is negatively charged how will that stain interact with the cell do like charges repel or do they attract and the answer is that like charges repel one another so um, stain is repelled by the cell because again the like charges are going to repel one another they're not going to want to interact and instead the background is stained and not the cell and so some examples of a negative stain that we're going to use would be like Congo red so Congo red we're going to use both in our negative stain and also in our capsule stain which we'll talk about in a minute um, we also have a type of negative stain called nigrosin which is going to be black um, there's one called India ink eosin etc and what these stains all have in common again is that they are an acidic stain they carry a negative charge on their oxychrome and as a result they stay in the background and not the cell so when we look at the bacteria we're going to look at various types of morphology and so some bacteria are going to appear caucus shaped or plural cocci some bacteria are going to be rod shaped in what we call bacillus shaped plural would be bacilli some bacteria would be what's called spirillum and these are going to be uh, rigid spirals some bacteria are going to be spirals but they're going to be flexible spirals and this shape is called spirochete some bacteria are what we call vibrio and vibrio basically means that they're curved rods and so these are the basic common types of morphologies that you would typically see if we look so this up here is morphology so again the shape of the bacteria down here we have the arrangement and that is how do the bacteria grow um, together or separate so some bacteria are strepto strepto means chains so you could get streptococcus for example so looking here this is streptococcus they're chains of caucus shaped bacteria so that's streptococcus you could have streptobacillus meaning that they're rods growing in a chain sometimes you'll see bacteria being staphylo and staphylo refers to the fact that these grow as grape like clusters whoops no g again grape like clusters and so instead of being in chains they grow as these little clusters so for example you could have staphylococcus meaning that you have lots of these grape like or um, lots of these round bacteria growing in clusters the one you don't typically see, you're not going to see, is going to be Staphylobacillus. So no Staphylobacillus. And that has to do with the way that the bacteria divide. Um, in Bacillus, they're going to divide along the short end, meaning that they're going to form chains. They don't divide uh, vertically. And so you're not going to find Staphylobacillus. You can find Streptobacillus, but not Staphylobacillus. Some bacteria are Diplo. Di means two. So what we're looking at here 
is diplococcus, two uh, round-shaped bacteria growing together. You could see diplobacillus, for example. And so you want to start becoming familiar with both morphology and arrangement. So what's an example of a medically important bacteria that can be seen with a negative stain? And so typically remember that the reason we do a negative stain is to visualize cells that could be fragile due to a heat fix step. And a type of bacteria that you'll typically see with this would be your spirochetes. And spirochetes, like what you're seeing here, spirochetes are, um, are going to be spirals, but again, they are flexible spirals. They're not a perfectly tight spiral. Notice you can see it almost has kind of a wavy appearance. Um, that's a spirochete. And if you do a spirochete using a simple stain, the heat, the heat fix step might affect the shape or the morphology. And so instead, it's best to visualize a spirochete using a negative stain because the negative stain lacks that heat fix step. So an example of treponema, or an example of a bacteria seen with a negative stain would be treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum is the organism um, that causes the sexually transmitted infection, or STI, that causes syphilis. And so, how do you get syphilis? Again, it's through, it's a sexually transmitted disease. So, through some sort of sexual contact. When we look at these organisms, um, one of the first signs of syphilis is known as what's called a canker. And so, what you're looking down here is you're looking at this canker, this clean, kind of painless, uh, ulcer-like appearance on genitalia. So an example in males, this could be found on the pe penis. It could be found on multiple sites. It could be on the vagina. It could be orally. But basically, one of the first signs of syphilis is going to be this canker. And this forms at the site of entry where the organism enters the body through the muco mucosal membranes or breaks in the epithelium. If you see multiple cankers, that means that typically more than one organism entered the body. And so um, the canker basically starts out as a local infection by treponema pallidum. And so this canker could be accompanied by swollen glands. Um, they may last from one to five weeks, and they may even disappear by itself if no treatment is received. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good thing. If you see these cankers and they disappear on their own, it does not mean that you're cured of syphilis. It could be that now your syphilis is going on to a later stage. About six weeks after the first sores appears, the second stage of the disease may start to appear. And the most common symptom during the stage is gonna be rash, which can appear on any part of the body. Other symptoms during secondary stage of syphilis um, can be tiredness, fever, sore throat, headaches, um, hoarseness, loss of appetite, hair loss, swollen glands, etc. And these signs and symptoms will last typically between two to six weeks and again generally can disappear in the absence of adequate treatments. The third stage, which is what we call late stage syphilis, um, this is typically syphilis over a longer period of time, several years. Um, late stage syphilis can involve tissues like the skin, um, they can involve bones, the central nervous system, and heart. Untreated syphilis can lead to destruction of soft tissue and bone, can lead to heart failure, blindness, and a variety of other conditions which may be mild to incapacitating. And so people sometimes will have problems with the brain as a result of late stage syphilis. Once syphilis progresses to late stage syphilis, um, it's much more difficult to treat. It's best if syphilis gets caught at the early stage, typically at the canker stage of the disease, so that it can be properly treated because this type of bacteria uh, or this type of organism is a bacteria. Bacteria can be treated with antibiotics, and typically penicillin 
can be used to treat um, syphilis. And so if it's properly caught and treated early on, you can become cured of syphilis. Once it progresses to late stage syphilis though, it's much more difficult to treat. Women with untreated syphilis can transmit the disease to unborn children, which can lead to death or deformity of the child. So again, it's always best to catch this early and to treat them. Another example of a spirochete um, is going to be Borrelia burgdorferi. And Borrelia burgdorferi causes Lyme disease. And Lyme disease, the way that you get Lyme disease, is that it gets into your blood. through a tick bite. So what ends up happening is that this tick will carry Borrelia burgdorferi. And once this tick will bite you, that will allow the organism to get into your blood. And so places where you would typically become infected with this organism would be if you live in areas that have kind of woods or forests and if you're out and you get bit by a tick typically the tick are found like in areas that are uh, that have deer in them and if you happen to get bit by this tick that causes Borrelia burgdorferi to get into your bloodstream and the, the characteristic stage or the characteristic sign of having Lyme disease is that it starts as this bullseye shaped rash. So notice you have this kind of middle, a clearing, and it has another red area. So look at, it looks like, like you would, if you're playing darts, it looks like a bullseye. Uh, the rash is about 15 centimeters big, typically in, the, in size. And this rash typically will be seen in about 75% of cases, meaning that most cages, most stages of Lyme disease start with this rash. rash. What then happens is flu-like symptoms appear in a couple weeks as the rash fades. So patients might get um, fatigued, tired, etc. Um, antibiotics taken during this interval are very effective in limiting the disease. Again, meaning that if you catch it early and you treat it, it's much more likely to be resolved than if you let it uh, keep progressing. During second phase of Lyme disease, uh, that's when the symptoms become more incapacitating. And so the heart becomes affected, um, and oftentimes a pacemaker is going to be required to help in a regular heartbeat. Um, you might have incapacitating chronic neurological symptoms, <laughs> such as uh, facial paralysis, fatigue, memory loss, etc. And in the third phase, sometimes arthritis appears or swelling of the joints. And so again, catching Lyme disease early and treating it is going to help with the prognosis. And so the way that we make a negative stain, again, is going to be a little bit different than how we would make a simple stain. And so what you would do is you would take your slide and you would want to label on the frosted part what is going to be on your slide. So remember when you do this you're going to put frosted side up, you're going to label the slide with your name so your initials, the date, negative stain, right, so you know what kind of stain is on this slide, and then you're going to test along your gum line. And so maybe on your slide you would label gum line. What you're going to do is you're going to start by putting a drop of Congo Red on your slide. Now, one of your questions in your question set says, what is wrong with the diagram found in your lab book? And the answer is that you don't want an entire drop of Congo Red. You only want a half drop, meaning that when you're dispensing the dye, instead of letting the drop fall all the way out of the dropper, instead you're going to squeeze the bulb, let a little bit of dye out, and then touch it to the slide. And that's going to give you this half drop of Congo Red, meaning it's not an entire drop. And the reason for that is that in this stain, remember, you can't use heat. So you're not going to air dry it on the slide warmer. You're not going to heat fix it. 
you need it to air dry. If you use an entire drop of Congo Red, it's going to take a long time for that stain to dry. And so it's much, much better to use only a half drop. So you're going to start by putting a half drop of Congo Red on your slide. Then you're going to take a sterile toothpick and you're going to run the toothpick along your gum line. So not on your tooth, don't scrape just your tooth. You don't need to poke your gum line, but just very gently run the toothpick along the gum line. Then you're going to take that toothpick where you swabbed your gum line and you're going to stir it into that drop of Congo Red. Now they used a loop, but because we are using um, a toothpick, you're going to do this using a toothpick. Then you're going to take a second slide and for the second slide, you're going to smear the dye all across um, your slide. And so what you do is you start by first pulling the slide in one direction. So notice they're pulling it towards the edge and then pushing it to the other end. And so what you want to do is essentially smear that Congo Red all across the slide. And once you're done with that slide that you use to smear the bacteria, um, take that slide and put it directly in the container that has the disinfectant. After you've smeared your bacteria, you're going to let it air dry. Again, no heat at this step, just let it air dry at your desk. And then you're going to view it under the microscope. Now, when we do this, we are going to have to go and use our 100x objective. And so remember that as we go up in magnification, right? So as we keep using the larger and larger lens, what ends up happening is, is that as we get to the larger and larger lens, remember that your field of view gets much smaller, meaning you're zooming in so much on one particular area. Also, the working distance, remember meaning the distance from the lens to the slide, gets much, much smaller because as that lens gets bigger, it's going to get closer to your glass slide. And as a result of that lens being so large and the working distance being so small, what ends up happening is, is that as we go up in magnification, our light intensity decreases. So as we go up, not as much light is, fun is funneled up and into that lens because as light hits this glass slide, as the light hits the glass, it's going to refract, meaning it's going to go in all different directions. So as we go up in magnification, let's put this on here. As we go up in magnification, you need to use a drop of immersion oil. And I'll demo this in class, but you need to put a little bit of immersion oil on the slide. And then you're going to put the 100x objective into place. Now, why use immersion oil? Well, immersion oil has a refractive index similar to glass, meaning that when the light hits the glass and then the immersion oil, it helps funnel the light up and into the lens. And so this is going to help to get the light into the lens so that we can visualize our specimen. And so anytime we use immersion oil, that's going to help the light get up and into the lens. And so that's what we're going to be doing when we get to our 100x objective. Now, a couple things about using your 100x objective. First and foremost, don't use your coarse focus. Remember, the coarse focus or the larger one closer to the base is going to adjust the stage up and down quickly. That working distance between the lens and the slide is so small. If you adjust using the coarse focus, you risk snapping the slide or worse, snapping the lens. And so you do not want to adjust using the coarse focus. You shouldn't need to. Your microscopes are parfocal. They should stay roughly in focus as you go up in magnification. Additionally, once there's oil on your slide, never, ever, ever go back to your 40x objective. Going back to your 40x objective and getting oil in that lens will damage the lens. That, that lens, remember, we call a high dry lens, meaning it's not supposed to have oil in it. One of the most common things that you'll see throughout the semester is that when you're using your microscope, you're not able to focus on your 40x objective. 
and that's due to the fact that probably at some point a student got oil up in the 40x objective. And so if that's the case, if you can't focus using your 40x, take a little bit of the lens cleaner on the lens paper and clean that lens really, really good because that's going to affect how you can focus. So next we're going to look at the capsule stain and the purpose of a capsule stain is to differentiate between capsule producing cells and unencapsulated cells, meaning this allows us to visualize or differentiate between cells that make capsules and those that don't. And so we call these a differential stain. They differentiate between different types of cells. So what is the function of the capsule? And so the first function of a capsule is it acts as an adherence factor. meaning that it makes the cells sticky and allows them to adhere to surfaces. So it might be that it allows um, the bacteria to adhere to surfaces outside the body. It might allow the bacteria to adhere to surfaces inside the body, but basically it helps the bacteria stick. The other function is that it protects the bacteria from dehydration, so meaning protects them from drying out, nutrient loss, and phagocytosis, meaning that these are anti phagocytic. And what that means is that your immune system primarily uses these sites called phagocytes. And these cells are able to do phagocytosis, which means that they can um, send out projections and engulf bacteria, take them in and destroy them. Bacteria that produce a capsule because they're sticky and because they adhere to surfaces, it makes it much more difficult for the phagocytes, those white blood cells, to do phagocytosis. They can't grab onto the bacteria, bring them in, and destroy them. And so what is it that makes that capsule sticky? Well, the composition of the capsule is that it's made of a mucoid, remember like mucousy, sticky polysaccharide, which is a carbohydrate, which is a sugar. It's many sugars linked together. Or... Very rarely, the capsule could be polypeptide, meaning it's made of protein. And this is, this is the case in Bacillus anthracis, which is the one that causes anthrax. They have a unique capsule that's made of a polypeptide. But most capsules, most commonly, would be made of this mucoid polysaccharide. It's very sticky. It's a, it's a very slimy kind of sugar. So notice this is our capsule stain here. And notice that the background is stained. And you also notice this part in the middle that's stained. That's the cell. So the cell is stained. And you might notice you can see in between the background and the cell is a clear area. And that clear area is going to be the capsule. So all of these clear areas around the cells are going to be the capsules. Now, the background is stained. What type of dye do you think is used where the background is stained? And remember that the answer is we're going to use an acidic or negative stain. And specifically in this case, we're going to use Congo Red. For the cell being stained, what type of stain would stain the cell? And the answer is a basic stain. 
and in this case we're going to use safranin and that's going to stain the cells pink pinkish red so in a capsule stain the background is stained because of the negative stain the cap the congo red the cell is stained because of the safranin and it's those clear areas that are the capsule and so the capsule is a structure that is external to the cell meaning it's on the outside so how do you uh, prepare a capsule stain so you're going to work in pairs and one person is going to be responsible for making a negative stain with club seal and ammonia the other person is going to make a negative stain with bacillus megatherium so as a pair you're going to have both organisms so again remember the method to make a negative stain put a half drop of congo red onto the slide then take bacteria using aseptic technique and put the bacteria on the slide with a loop now typically like in our gram stain remember I told you to use a needle to transfer the bacteria onto the slide because you don't want to pick up too much however in this capsule stain remember that the bacteria is going to be very sticky and it's going to be harder to transfer the bacteria from the the loop or the needle onto the slide so we're going to use a loop to pick up a little bit more to ensure that we can transfer the bacteria onto the slide so use a loop an aseptic technique meaning don't forget to flame sterilize your loop let it cool before you pick up the bacteria and then you're going to touch the bacteria you're going to swirl it in your congo red and then just like for the negative stain you're going to use a slide and you're going to push the dye out and pull it across the slide so again notice the beginning is exactly like the negative stain you're doing exactly the same procedure because remember you want the background to be stained so that you can see the colorless capsule don't forget take the slide um, that you used for the smearing and put it in the disinfectant you need to air dry this no heat so don't use the slide warmers to air dry your slide then you're going to flood the cell with the hydrochloric acid for 30 seconds meaning put it on there let it sit for 30 seconds after the 30 seconds dump off the hydrochloric acid but don't rinse the slide the function of the hydrochloric acid is that it kills the bacteria and helps coagulate the proteins so notice that it does something very similar to the heat fix step but without the heat after you kill the bacteria and adhere them to the slide then you're going to add the safranin put it on the slide let it sit for one minute after the one minute dump off the safranin and rinse gently with the water meaning you're going to squirt above where the bacteria is let it run down the slide just to rinse off any excess safranin and then you're going to let it air dry and then you're going to put it on your microscope and view it on the microscope and the background should be stained with the Congo red the cells should be stained with the safranin and the capsule is going to be the colorless part and so the next slide is just basically visualizing how you would do this now we don't use um, this jar like they do here uh, but for the most part this um, procedure is very similar to what we're doing and when we actually do this, I will demonstrate this in class.